As the saying goes, when you play with fire, you could get burned. Some could say that this case is an example of that. A man who takes his own actions a bit too far without realizing that the person he is threatening is going to respond with extreme force. The way the situation in this case unraveled is truly disturbing and led to so many lives being torn apart. This story involves a whole web of threats, lies, and deception, and the way it plays out is wild. But before we get into this case, if you wear glasses, you are going to want to hear from today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you haven't already heard, GlassesUSA.com is one of the biggest and best eyewear retailers in the U.S., offering thousands of eyeglasses and sunglasses brands such as Ray-Ban, Gucci, Oakley, and so many more. They also offer contact lenses. Now, when it comes to online shopping, the endless choices can feel overwhelming. But GlassesUSA.com also offers a virtual try-on tool, which makes it so much easier to figure out what style of glasses you like and what looks best on you. GlassesUSA.com also just launched this super cool app, Perfect Match AI. It's like having your own personal stylist for glasses. It uses advanced technology to analyze your face and style to perfectly match you with frames that fit your look. It's super fun and quick. It just analyzes your face. You take a quick quiz and boom, you are matched with your perfect pair. And the best part of about glassesusa.com is the price point. Glasses start at just $39, which is up to 70% off of retail prices. They offer some of my favorite brands such as Amelia E, which are the super cute pair that I'm wearing right now. These have been my favorite go-to pair when I'm on my computer all day. These actually have blue light blocking coating, which helps to protect your eyes while looking at screens. Using blue light blocking glasses helps to reduce my eye strain, decrease headaches, and improve productivity. I also have another pair of Amelia E eyeglasses, which again are another pair of my go-tos. Then I also have this super cute pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses. I love how reflective they are and the colors are just so unique. But if you're like me and you normally wear contacts throughout the day and your glasses at night, don't worry, they've got you covered. GlassesUSA.com is also the perfect place to stock up and save on your contact lenses. You can get 25% off all contact lens brands, including Vista, AccuView, Dailies, BioInfinity, which is what I wear, and so many more. They are available with any prescription and for all uses. So if you like any of the glasses that I've shown you or you're ready to find your perfect match, just click the link in the description box below. GlassesUSA.com is giving my viewers an extra $10 off any existing coupon or sale. So don't wait, grab your deal and find your new favorite pair today. With all of that being said, I'm going to be removing my glasses for the remainder of the video as I know the glare is bothersome for some viewers. Okay, with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today's case is a wild one, so strap in and let's get started. Holly Williams was born and raised in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. As a child, her parents were divorced and Holly spent most of her child living with her father and stepmother. It was said that Holly had a difficult relationship with her mother and she eventually became estranged from her mother. After graduating high school, she moved from her hometown to Nashville, Tennessee. Those closest to Holly describe her as being sweet and trusting. She was outgoing and exuberant. At the time, 33-year-old Holly worked as a medical esthetician and looked like a Kardashian, so friends said that when you first meet her, you don't know what to expect. But anytime she met someone new, she was that person who could make them feel welcome and included. She was very humble, a little quiet at times, and super sweet. Holly was known as loving to go out, frequenting the downtown areas in Nashville on Broadway and Midtown. Overall, she just loved the nightlife and dancing to music. She would go out with friends, but she would also go out alone and make friends along the way. Regardless, anytime she went out, men would flock to her. She was absolutely stunning, and men were always coming to her, offering her to light a cigarette. One friend said that anytime they went out, she would be surrounded by men who were interested in her. It never stopped. Sometime in 2018, Holly was at a music festival when she met then 36-year-old William Lanway. Bill was described as being outgoing and the life of the party. He was fun to be around, easygoing, and popular. He too loved the nightlife and frequented downtown Nashville to party and dance. After the two met, they immediately were drawn to one another and became enmeshed in each other's lives. They started going to EDM shows all the time, taking party drugs together, and dancing the nights away. But Bill had a bit of a dark past that affected his personality and how he lived his life. 
Of course, we all carry the traumas we face as a child with us all throughout our lives. Tragedies can affect us in unexpected ways, and the way we behave as adults can be a result of unhealed wounds. For Bill, he dealt with a lot more in his life than most people have at his age. When he was only three years old, Will's father, Lyle Lanway, held him, his mother, and a babysitter hostage at gunpoint for several hours after a dispute between Lyle and Will's mother over her going on a shopping trip. Police were eventually called, but when they arrived, it took over five hours to talk Lyle down before he ultimately released his hostages. After this, he was arrested and taken to the hospital for mental health treatment. But then, a week after this, Lyle was granted a day pass to be released from the hospital for Thanksgiving so he could spend the holiday with his family. This would end up being a huge mistake, though, because after Lyle's release, he ended up stabbing his wife and killing her right in front of Will and his sister. Will and his sister had actually run to a neighbor's house to get help, and by the time police arrived, Lyle had managed to escape. That was until Lyle ended up crashing his car into the main entrance of the hospital he was originally being held at. At the time, police apprehended him and saw that he had actually stabbed himself in the arm, which he got treatment for. Ultimately, Lyle would be charged with the first-degree murder of his wife and was sent to prison for the rest of his life. After all of this, he went on to be raised by his aunt and uncle. As an adult, Will ended up getting married and having a daughter named Madison. Madison was such a light in Will's life. She taught him patience, kindness, and love. He loved being her father, and she was the driving force in his life that made him want to be a better man. However, when Madison was only five years old, she passed away from brain cancer. After this tragic, devastating loss, according to those who knew Will back then, his entire personality changed. Of course, this put an enormous amount of strain on the relationship between him and the mother of Madison, so they split up. It was after this when Will fell deep into a lifestyle of partying, doing drugs, and heavy drinking. It was during this time when he met Holly. As I said, their relationship progressed very quickly and they were soon inseparable. He eventually moved into Holly's apartment and the two fell deeply in love. At the time, Will didn't really have much of a reliable source of income. He was delivering some Amazon packages and dealing for high-stakes poker games on occasion, but he wasn't really bringing in enough money to support himself. Meanwhile, Holly was paying her rent and helping to support the both of them. But their relationship took a dark turn by early 2019. By this point, Holly and Will had been dating for a bit of time, but all throughout that time, Holly was living a secret life that Will knew nothing of. One day, Will was snooping through Holly's phone when he discovered that Holly was working as an escort. Starting sometime, I believe, in 2018, and might have been before that, but Holly started working as an escort on various websites using the name Lila Love. According to one friend, she started this work because of how much attention she was always getting from men. She knew she was beautiful and used that to make some extra money. She could get $1,500 for one night with one person or $2,500 for a couple. If she spent an entire weekend with someone, she could bank as much as twenty dollars to $30,000. That being said, Holly knew that this kind of work was not without its risks. She tried her best to do this as safely as she could. She charged enough to make sure she was only dealing with higher class men. Anytime she would meet up with a new client, she would message the other escorts on their websites asking about the client to make sure they were safe. She would only go out with the men who had a good history with the other escorts and acted appropriately. Still, there was always a worry in the back of her mind, so she was very open with her close friends about what she was doing. She wanted at least someone to know what she was doing so that if something did happen, someone in her life would know where to find her. Holly continued this work even after she started dating Will. Of course, finding this out about your partner, especially if they were hiding it from you, it's devastating. 
it's very much a breach of your trust and it deeply affects the other person not just emotionally but if she were to catch some sort of std or sti he is susceptible to that unknowingly it's just such a huge secret to keep someone and i can see how it would just shatter someone's entire world and it's such a breach of trust and it really is putting that other person at risk and they deserve to know if the other person is doing these types of things but even after finding out will didn't stop dating holly at that point, he was in too deep. He already had feelings for her and was already living with her. Instead of breaking things off with Holly, things in the relationship just grew toxic and Will started acting out. He became controlling, possessive, and jealous. The two started fighting so badly that by April of 2019, Holly called the police and requested an order of protection against Will. At that time, Holly told officers that Will had stolen the SD card out of her phone, punched her in the mouth, and then punched the windshield of her car and broke it. However, after initially filing this request, she did drop it. Later that year, in December of 2019, Will had moved out of Holly's apartment and she changed the lock and the keypad combination to get in. She also installed security cameras all around the apartment to catch Will anytime he tried coming in because there had been a few times where Will broke into her apartment while looking for her. Despite this, the two stayed together on and off as their fighting and arguing just continued to escalate. After one big fight, which had turned very heated and physical, Nicole, Will broke into Holly's apartment and took her dog, Max. He then drove the dog to the highway and dropped him off on the side of the road. The dog ended up getting hit by a car and died, which is very, very, very tragic and absolutely disgusting of Will to do. At the time, Will was arrested and charged with aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and animal cruelty. After all of this, Holly swore up and down that this was the final straw in their relationship. But as it happens in toxic cycles like this one, the two ended up getting back together. Whenever they got back together, Will would always find ways to continue going through Holly's phone. He ended up finding a client list and started messaging various men on that list, telling them to stay away from Holly or else he would expose their relationship to their respective wives. Of course, this led Holly to losing a bunch of clients who didn't want their dirty laundry exposed. By early 2020, Holly was back at it, trying to get new clients after so many of her old ones ran off. Obviously, Will was not happy about this, and their on-again, off-again relationship continued. They continued their heated, intense arguments. Will continued on his jealousy streak, sending threatening messages to any and all clients he could find on Holly's phone. He would act out breaking Holly's personal belongings, even once taking Holly's car and returning it to her with flat tires. They continued breaking up and making up, continuing this vicious cycle. It was overall just a bad situation for both of them, and it seemed like both Holly and Will lacked respect for not just each other, but themselves. Holly knew very well that her partner was not okay with her escorting. Yet, she didn't care enough about the relationship to stop or even have a serious conversation about it. They couldn't come to any sort of mutual agreement that would leave them both satisfied. Instead, she just continued what she was doing, basically telling Will to stop being so jealous and to stop being so toxic and abusive. Meanwhile, Will couldn't handle the fact that Holly was working as an escort, sleeping with other men. It sent him into a spiral that he couldn't get out of, yet he didn't respect himself enough to just leave the relationship. Instead of realizing that she wasn't going to stop, realizing that this isn't what he wanted in a relationship, he acted out and tried controlling Holly and the situation instead of just leaving it. Overall, this is just a very toxic situation for the both of them, both playing their own parts in the madness. Then, everything took the most tragic, devastating turn for the couple by March of 2020. By early in the morning of March 13th, a construction worker arrived at his work site along Old Hickory Boulevard in Nashville. At the work site, the worker noticed a white Acura down in a ditch along the gravel road. It was obvious that this car had crashed there. The man took a closer look, and inside the car, he saw two people who weren't moving and were unresponsive. 
there was a petite white woman with black hair hunched over in the back seat of the car on the floorboard. Then there was a large white man who was fully upside down in the front passenger seat. Of course, this man called 911 to report the fatal crash. Once detectives arrived on scene, the initial thought was that this was a devastating car crash. It looked like the car had skid off the road, then rolled down the hill, flipping the people in the car all sorts of ways before finally slamming into a tree. Of course, the man and the woman in the car were, in fact, Will and Holly. However, once investigators looked more closely at the bodies inside that car, they realized that this wasn't just a crash. Both Holly and Will had been shot and killed sometime before the car went down in that embankment. So now, this case suddenly turned from a tragic accident to a double homicide. The first thing detectives did was investigate the car itself. In the car, they found several bullet fragments lodged inside the car, which they removed and sent for examination. They also lifted several prints and examined blood splatter from both the interior and the exterior of the car. They also searched for the murder weapon, looking to see if they could find the gun used in the shooting, but it was nowhere to be found. After this, they then started to focus on who Holly and Will were as individuals and what their relationship was like and who they interacted with in their day-to-day -day lives. Of course, they found out pretty quickly that Will and Holly had a very toxic relationship. They immediately discovered the multiple police calls Holly made with various accusations of domestic violence. They found several text messages between them, all of which showed just how nasty they were with one another. They even found messages from earlier the same day as the car crash, March 12th. I'll get more into these messages and everything else they found on their social medias and text messages in just a few minutes. But I do want to note that at the jump, once their bodies were discovered and after knowing just how toxic their relationship was, investigators, family, and friends all initially believed that it was possible this was a murder-suicide. Maybe Will lashed out, got Holly in the car with him, shot her, then shot himself, causing the car to lose control and fly down that embankment. However, this theory was quickly dismissed because again, the gun was not found anywhere near the scene. If it had been, the gun would have either been in that car or somewhere in the immediate area after falling out of the window. He would not have been able to shoot himself then somehow hide the gun. Then it was found that both Will and Holly were shot multiple times. It is very, very unlikely and almost impossible that Will would have been able to shoot himself more than once if he were taking his own life. So, based on this information, police realized that someone else had to be involved in both of their murders. Now, like I stated earlier, Holly had installed some security cameras around her apartment in an attempt to keep Will from breaking in. Well, investigators went ahead and reviewed that footage, and what they found was disturbing to say the least. They were able to listen to the very moment in which both Will and Holly were brutally kidnapped before they were shot and killed. On that footage taken from the evening of March 12, 2020, video from outside of the unit shows both Holly and Will exiting their apartment together. Holly walks out first, followed shortly by Will, who walks out behind her. They walk down the short, dark path towards the parking lot. What was strange about the footage was that it appeared that someone had turned the camera towards the apartment door so that it only captured people coming in and out. It wasn't facing outwards to capture what was happening outside of the apartment like most doorbell cameras would. Either way, even though it didn't capture video of what exactly happened outside the apartment, it certainly picked up the sound. In the recording, you hear the car door opening and Holly and Will getting inside. You hear the car's engine turning on, but then you hear Will yelling, what the F, which is immediately followed by several gunshots. As the shots are going off, you hear high-pitched screaming with Holly yelling, please God help me, help me. You hear Holly continuing to scream and yell while Will's voice suddenly goes silent. Then you hear the car drive away while the sounds of Holly screaming get more faint until they completely fade away. This footage was incredibly upsetting for anyone who viewed it. Even the investigators who watched that footage were disturbed and had a hard time listening to it. It was just 
horrible. Based on what they heard in this footage, it's obvious that someone came to the apartment where Holly lived and somehow knew that both her and Will were going to be there. They were then confronted by this person as they got in their car and were shot. Then the shooter most likely got into the car, then drove them off the road and into a ditch, maybe in hopes that it would take longer to find the car. Now, like I said, early in the investigation, detectives started looking into the text messages and social medias of both Holly and Will. There, they discovered Holly's work as an escort, as well as how Will reacted to this information. They found that Holly had a whole list of clients and they saw how Will was reaching out to these men, all threatening to expose what they were doing to their wives. Well, there was one client in particular who stood out to investigators. This client was 46-year-old Eric Charles Mund. Now, Eric Mund was raised in a very well-off family who owned and operated a Toyota car dealership out of Austin, Texas. His grandfather, Charles, built up the family business from nothing back in 1957, then went on to expand and grow the business into an empire of multiple dealerships, earning the family wealth that expanded multiple generations. The Mund family is very well known in the area, not just for their vast wealth, but also for their social status, involving themselves in the highest social circles all around that area. Eric was married to his wife of 22 years, Sherry, and together they had two children. For a while, Sherry worked at the dealership as well, but would ultimately spend her time raising her two children. The family lived in a $5 million home that backed up to the Austin County Club's golf course. There, Eric could often be found playing rounds of golf with his close-knit group of rich friends. Eric Mund had a son who, at the time, was attending college in Nashville, Tennessee. Eric would regularly visit his son in Nashville, and during one of these trips, he met a beautiful woman who went by the name Layla Love. As we know from before, Layla Love is actually Holly, who is working as an escort. During one of those visits, Eric became a client of hers. But at that time, Eric introduced himself as Eric Moore, wanting to avoid using his real name. By February 3rd, 2020, Eric was preparing to visit his son in Nashville once again. As he was preparing for his visit, he decided to send Layla Love an email saying that he was going to be in Nashville soon and would love to meet up with her again. He wrote, Good day, beautiful. Looking forward to later. I'm in Nashville. I'll meet you in the bar like last time. Text me when you arrive. In this email, he set up a time to meet up at a Nashville hotel, requesting that they meet for 90 minutes so that they're not rushed. The two met at the JW Marriott Hotel in downtown Nashville on February 5th, where everything went as expected. Eric then apparently spent some time with his son at the college before returning home to Austin by February 7th. However, a few weeks after returning home on March 1st, 2020, Eric received a message on his phone from an unknown number. The text demanded $25,000 from Eric or else he would expose everything to his wife. This absolutely sent Eric into a panic and he immediately started to get to work to figure out what to do. Somehow, the blackmailer had figured out his real identity, even though he used a fake last name when hiring escorts. Then, this person found his phone number, address, and where he worked. This person could fully expose Eric, and Eric simply could not have that. If you haven't guessed by now, the unknown number belonged to William Landway. Police discovered these messages on Will's phone and immediately identified Eric Mund as a person of interest in the case. From there, because the case now crossed state lines from Tennessee to Texas, the FBI got involved. And what the FBI were able to uncover through their investigation was just insane. The lengths that Eric went to to cover his involvement with escorts was extensive. After identifying Eric as a person of interest, the FBI were able to gain access to his cell phone records. Using that, they found that Eric had been in extensive contact with someone in the weeks leading to the murders. Not only that, but just days after receiving the blackmail text, Eric had transferred $15,000 to this person's account. That obviously looked suspicious, so the FBI worked to identify this other person. Eventually, after looking more extensively into Eric's communications, they were able to identify this man as Gilad Pelled, the dealership's new security guard. 
Now, Gilad had just been hired on at the dealership by the Munns, but he did have a pretty extensive military history. He claimed to have served as a special agent with Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency. After moving to the United States, he landed some high-stakes bodyguard jobs, some being for big Hollywood stars such as Charlie Sheen. Gilad always took his job as a bodyguard very seriously, and he looked the part too. He had a big build with a shaved head, and he just had this very serious and intimidating look on his face. By 2014, Gilad moved to Austin, Texas, where he had some family members. There, he sort of struggled to find work, taking on different security jobs, until he landed the job with the Munns at their dealership in early 2020. There, he would mostly just look out for vandals, keep an eye on inventory, and make sure things were looking good. Nothing too crazy or exciting. But knowing that Gilad had this extensive history of working with special intelligence and being trained in negotiation tactics, Eric decided to confide in Gilad about the blackmail and asked for his help with dealing with this person. Gilad agreed and immediately got to work with identifying the blackmailer and thinking of a plan of how to take care of the situation. But with that, Gilad requested that he put together a team to start their surveillance on the blackmailer. He suggested a couple of different men who he trusted and who he felt were the best in the business. One man was Brian Brockway, a former Marine and a special op with the CIA. At the time, he had been living in Austin and he owned his own security company. Using his connections within that security company, Brian was able to identify the blackmailer as Will Lanway and the escort as Holly Williams. He was also able to figure out Holly's address in Nashville. Using that information, Brian and Gilad wanted to run some surveillance on the couple to gather intelligence and figure out their next move. To do this, Brian contacted another trusted friend of his, 29-year-old Adam Carey. Adam was also a former Marine who, at the time, was working as an independent contractor for another security company. Brian then hired a third man whose name has been released, but he isn't really a huge part of this case in terms of any involvement, so I'm just not going to mention his name, though you can find it in some articles. After putting together this team, Gilad requested $50,000 from Eric to start gathering intelligence. This job would require a lot of hours, manpower, and travel expenses. By March 5th, Eric withdrew his first payment, which was $15,000 to cover the costs of the intelligence report that Gilad would write up on Holly and Will. They used the information they previously gathered based on their locations, names, and backgrounds that could be found in their records and on their social medias. Now, in that initial document, which was written like a professional military-style report, Gilad noted that Holly lived alone and that Will was a frequent visitor, not a live-in boyfriend. Gilad felt that Holly was unaware of Will's blackmail attempts, noting that it would be bad for her business. It was very unlikely that Holly would go out of her way to breach a client's trust by exposing them to their wives. That would be professional suicide. Meanwhile, Gilad documented Will's apparent controlling and jealous nature. Based on Facebook posts Holly had made in the past, you could see clear as day that the couple were having issues and that Will was the main cause of them. Will seemed to be acting alone in his blackmail attempts. This document also detailed how the group should proceed with this information, saying that they will use everything at their disposal, including intimidation, to stop the attempted extortion. Gilad wrote that he would need another fifty dollars to $60,000 to continue surveillance and figure out how to get rid of the problem. By around March 7th, the three med, Gilad, Adam, and the third unnamed man, all headed out to Tennessee. During their surveillance, Adam had reached out to Will via an encrypted texting app on multiple occasions trying to get information out of him. Then, once in Nashville, the three men approached Holly's apartment multiple times trying to get her to answer the door to speak with her. But each time they came by, she saw three strange men standing on her porch via her security camera, so she never opened the door. I can't say I blame her, and I probably also wouldn't have opened my door. By March 10th, as they were watching Will, they actually spotted him in a Kroger parking lot driving Holly's white Acura. Once the car was parked and Will went in the store, the men let the air out of the car's tires. 
Once Will was exiting the store, the three men approached him and followed him to the car. But Will didn't seem bothered or intimidated by these men in the slightest. He just got in his car and slammed the door in their faces before driving off. Now, like I mentioned earlier, once Will got home, Holly noticed that the tires on her car were flat and she was pissed. She thought that this was Will's doing, but as we know, it was these men. But Will did not tell Holly about the confrontation. He basically just tried telling her that a random man let the air out of her tires. But of course, Holly did not believe him. And on the other side of this, these men who confronted Will, they now had the impression that Will was not willing to speak with them. They felt that they needed to take a more drastic approach. But after four days of surveilling them, they were getting no closer to getting the problem solved. By that point, the third unnamed man left the trio and returned to Austin, saying that he had another job to get to. Then, by the evening of March 11, 2020, Eric received a call on his landline. The call was from an unknown number, and the voice on the other end demanded his payment of $25,000 by 8 p.m. that night, or else he'd tell Sherry everything. This sent Eric into full-blown panic mode. At that point, Gilad was back in Austin after their failed surveillance attempt. Eric decided that night to meet up with Gilad where they discussed their next steps. According to investigators, it was this night when Gilad brought up the idea of killing both Will and Holly, and Eric jumped at the idea. Without hesitation, he agreed to it. Gilad discussed a price of $750,000 total for the hit, which Eric agreed to. I do want to note that, as I said earlier, Gilad determined that Holly was not involved in the blackmail, yet he ultimately decided that both of them needed to be taken out. We don't exactly know why, but it was that night when this decision was made. From there, Brian, who again was the man who connected Gilad with Adam, decided to get out there and join in on the mission. By the evening of March 11th, Brian flew out to Austin from Nashville, picked up a rental car, and then met up with Adam. By the evening of March 12th, the security cameras at Holly's apartment capture her and Will leaving her unit for the last time. Earlier in that surveillance stint, the men had actually moved the camera so that it wouldn't be facing the parking lot, making it so that it wouldn't capture what happened next. But as we know from before, the camera did pick up the sound of what happened. According to investigators, after Will and Holly left the apartment, they went to their cars in the parking lot. There, Brian and Adam ambushed them, first shooting Will two times in the head through the car window. They then drove both Holly's 2005 white Acura as well as their own rental car to the construction site near Old Hickory Boulevard in Nashville. There, they also shot Holly multiple times in the head as well. They then staged both bodies in the car to make the scene look like a crash. By the following day, March 13th, as we know, a construction worker discovered the bodies as he started work for that day. In the meantime, Brian and Adam returned that rental car. After that, Adam drove back in his own car back to Austin while Brian caught a flight back home. After the job was complete, Eric had transferred a total of $750,000 in different increments to Brian, Adam, and Gilad. The job was complete and Eric could now move on with his life. However, as we know, police are not just going to leave this case alone. Two people were clearly murdered, and their crash was so obviously staged. As I stated, the three men we discussed had tried to communicate with Holly multiple times before the crash by going to her apartment. It was during the searches of these cameras when investigators found the videos which showed all three men approaching at multiple different times. Using this, police actually released still images of the three men in hopes of identifying them. As we know from earlier, investigators started uncovering all of this information based on Eric's relationship with Gilad. After looking into him, they found a bunch of those text messages between them, including that one unnamed man who left the operation early. This man was originally fully willing to do the surveillance and help out with stopping the extortion, but he was not down for a murder plot. As I stated earlier, he did have another job elsewhere, but he also just had a bad feeling about the whole situation as time went on. That was part of the reason why he left. Well, 
By the summer of 2021, officers located this man and asked them to work with them, which he agreed to. He wore a wire and placed some phone calls where he spoke with Brian, Gilad, and Adam. In those calls, he discussed different made-up hit jobs and lightly brought up their past one into conversation. This was enough for investigators to find and arrest Adam, Gilad, and Brian. After these arrests, Gilad also started working with investigators. He too agreed to make phone calls, but this time he would incriminate Eric. After all, he was the one who started this all. He was the one who agreed with Gilad to do the hit. He was the one who financed all of it. During one of the calls, Gilad told Eric that Adam was asking for more money to keep quiet about the hit. In response, Eric said that Adam also needed to be killed. He was about to order yet another hit. That was enough for investigators to finally arrest Eric in connection with the murder for hire plot. Using all of the information I've outlined up to this point, police finally charged all four defendants with charges of murder for hire resulting in death, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, and kidnapping resulting in death, among other charges. Adam, Brian, and Eric all pleaded not guilty to their charges, while again, Gilad actually pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against the others in their trials. The men all sat in jail and awaited their trials for the two years that followed. By November of 2023, the joint trial for all three defendants, Eric, Adam, and Brian, began. The prosecution argued that Eric enlisted the help of Gilad Peled after receiving the text messages that threatened to out him to his wife for sleeping with escorts. Gilad acted as a middleman involving Adam and Brian in his scheme to intimidate Will. But as things progressed with their surveillance and after multiple failed attempts at communicating with Will and Holly, the group turned to murder. Eric and Gilad agreed to the terms initially, then sent Adam and Brian out to get it done. The prosecutions brought forward the cell phone data, which showed all the encrypted text exchanges between the men in the days leading to the murders, as well as location data, which showed all four of them together before the three ultimately went to Nashville to do their surveillance. They found that intelligence report that was written up on the couple. They pointed to bank transactions, which showed Eric paying all three men a total of $1 million over the course of this whole thing. They showed the security cameras from Holly's apartment, which showed the previous times these men went to her place, as well as the day of the murder, where you hear Will being shot and Holly screaming as she's being taken away. The prosecution was arguing that on the day of the murders, it was Brian who shot Will in the apartment parking lot before he drove the Acura with Will's body in it. Adam then put Holly into that rental car before driving them both to the construction site. There, Adam killed Holly, then put her body into her own car and staged the scene to make it look like a crash. Then at the trial, Gila testified and told the courts everything that happened. He spoke about everything that I've told you up to this point, from how he got connected with Eric, to how they got the team together, to how they ended up deciding on killing Will and Holly. His testimony was crucial in putting all of this together and painting a clear picture of the timeline and everything that happened. On the other hand, the defense for Adam and Brian basically pointed the finger at each other as being responsible for the murders. Meanwhile, Eric's defense basically said that he didn't know there was a plan to kill them. He never agreed to killing Holly and Will. The people he hired to do the surveillance went rogue. His defense said that Eric never intended for anybody to be hurt or killed. Yes, he did communicate with Gilad about taking care of the extortion problem, but he wanted it solved in a non-violent way. These men took advantage of him, knowing that he would give them a big payout. They went off on their own and killed Will and Holly on their own. The defense for all of these men told the jury the difference between facts and theories in this case. Don't just listen to the government's theories. Listen to the facts and decide for yourselves what truly happened. The trial lasted a total of two weeks, and after bringing forth all of the evidence and hearing closing arguments on both sides, the jury was off for deliberations. They ended up deliberating for over seven hours before coming back with their verdicts. They found both Brian and Adam guilty for charges of murder for hire resulting in death, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, and kidnapping resulting in death. Meanwhile, Eric Mund was convicted of the conspiracy to commit murder for hire, but he was found not guilty for the kidnapping charges. 
For their charges, Brian, Adam, and Eric all received life sentences. Then, as far as I've seen at this time, Gilad does have yet to be sentenced for his role in this. It seems to be very delayed, but I don't know the status of Gilad's sentencing or when he will be sentenced. But as of right now, that is all of the information we know on today's case. This case is truly a wild one for me because Eric literally had so many options. He could have gone to the police about this. He could have just paid the $25,000, which honestly would have saved him a ton of money in the end. He could have just came clean to his wife. He did have a prenup with his wife, so it's not like he would have lost a ton of money. Yes, his reputation would take a hit, but that's his own damn fault. Obviously, Holly and Will had their problems. It's not okay to be extorting someone like Will did, but clearly Will had his own things to work out and it was not up to Eric to just decide that Will needed to go. And then to add to that, the fact that Holly was caught up in all of this is just devastating. They all admitted that they didn't think that Holly even knew about the extortion. So why did they involve her in the hit? That's a question I don't know if we will ever have answers to. It's just so heartbreaking and honestly stupid how all of this went down. Holly and Will lost their lives for absolutely no reason, and I'm glad the people responsible are behind bars, and let's hope they stay there for the rest of their lives. But now I want to hear from you guys. What do you think about this case overall? Do you think Holly knew about the extortion? If not, why do you think she was targeted along with Will? Do you think that Eric knew about the murder plot and went along with it? Why do you think Adam and Brian went through with this when they really had no skin in the game? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.